Hi, Nick Vince here. Today on the Chattering Hour, I'm joined by Galen Ross. We talk about her roles in George Romero's The Dawn of the Dead and his collaboration with Stephen King, Creepshow. Galen also starred in the cult aces slasher Madman. We talk about that and her career as an award-winning documentary maker. All that and more up next on the Chattering Hour with Galen Ross. We're back with Galen Ross. We talk about the secret she kept from George Romero for many years after making Daughter of the Dead, what it was like working with Leslie Nielsen, who had a love of a fart machine. And we also talk in depth about her fascinating career as an award-winning documentary maker. Let's get to it. So I want to take you right back to the very beginning to oh, Indianapolis, God. where you were a girl. What was a What was a typical day like for you when you were a child? Oh, I have no idea. You know, I mean, you have to, it it was complicated because it was great. You know, I mean, I think growing up when I did, you know, it was a very relaxed time for kids. No seatbelts, throw them where they are. Kids go out till late at night riding bikes. And, you know, at the same time, we were a Jewish family, Democratic family and a very Republican family. um, Christian neighborhood and this was an interesting time in Indiana as well it was a lot of anti-semitism it was Indiana was the home of the Ku Klux Klan so you know it was an in, it was a conservative um, place to grow most of my friends have left uh, they left at high school or after I think um, went on to other states New York California <laughs> a little bit uh, you know so there were a lot of pluses to growing up we had a lot of fun um went to the library walked played basketball you know I mean all the kinds of things that kids did then at the same time there was um and it continues to this day how Indiana is a very repressive um very conservative state right Right. as a red one as they call it right and then do you remember when you first became attracted to cinema I didn't. I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't attracted to I love going to the movies, but cinema, um, I started, you know, as a, in the literary world, um, I was a poetry editor and, a, and um, for a press that still exists today, a managing editor for it's called Antaeus and Echo Press. And that's how I went to college. And, and so my interest was not in theater or acting or any of that, but I started acting after that. And that was uh, mostly for theater. You know, the New York at the time was doing a lot of um, small theaters. They called them showcases and we did them. And there was a particular place where we all were working then called Downstairs at the West Bank Cafe. And this was started by a bunch of guys from Yale, including the comic Lewis Black. And we would go down there. And I think they did like a thousand one act plays and we would direct. And I mean, everybody had somehow had their their first plays done at the at the West Bank. Um, I mean, I can't remember names now, but they were all, you know, um, Andrew Sorkin and um, Alan Menkes. And, you know, we could go on and on about who who had productions done at the West Bank. And from there. I started to get interested in directing as well and uh, directing a theater. Right, right. So do you, I mean, you said you went to the cinema. Did you have particular favorite films or actors or genres of film? No, I think I just liked anything that was really entertaining. I like to be scared, but not in horror. I love being scared by great mysteries, like wait until dark or something like that. But nothing, um, you know, nothing that musicals, I think when I was young, 
Um, the other thing that was really my my sister and I would would have they had the Saturday night. It was late nights. They called him. I don't know if you remember. It was an American um, presenter called Sammy Terry, which was the pun on cemetery. And right. Sammy Terry would have his late night television show. It started at eleven, and my mother would let us stay up. And we would have pizza and they would do things like House on Haunted Hill and all those classics. And my, and, and my sister and I were, would watch it for like 15 minutes before we were terrified and turned it off. But um, that was as close to horror as I got. But I remember Sammy Terry, who was great. He always started out coming out of the coffin. <laughs> so you went to college in both California and New York? Yes, I uh -huh. went to California and Monterey Peninsula College, which was in the late, late 60s or 70s, which was a very iconic time to be in California. And then uh, left for New York and went to the New School for Social Research to finish my degree in literature. What you, now, you mentioned literature, you mentioned poetry. Who are your favorite authors? Oh my gosh, there were so many of them. We we published all of them. I mean, from Louise Gluck and Seamus Haney to you know, I mean, all of them, all of them were part of Antaeus. Every one of them. Wow. I mean, I think Antaeus and Paris Review and Partisan were the most famous magazines of its time. Certainly, uh, the poets continue in Echo Press. So, and um, what about reading in terms of reading books? What sort of novel? What what's your favorite novel? Favorite writer. I think at the time there was a bookstore in New York called The Strand, still there. But that what they would do is that they they had a downstairs, they still may, called The Reviewer's Return. And so this one guy, I can't remember his name, I think Bart or Brett, or, he used to run The Reviewer's Return. So when reviewers didn't like the books, he would take them and then he would tell people, you know, you have to read this because it's really great. The critics didn't know what they were talking about. So I think he was the one who actually first started promoting and getting people to read the Latin American writers. And Gabriel Marquez was one of them. Nobody was reading 100 Years of Solitude because all the reviewers were returning it. And he said, no, 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 you have to get this book. So we would all go down there and we get the newest books and um, well, from him. And, um, you know, I read a lot. I don't read as much anymore. Now I read mostly things that have to do with research. You right. know, So I end up doing a lot of that. Right. Right. Do you remember, okay, as a kid, you said you were going to the library a lot. Do you remember any particular book from your childhood? Oh, my mother used to read me all the Grimm's fairy tales. Maybe that's why I started getting interested. And they were horrible. I mean, they were wonderful, but they were horrible. I mean, everybody got things cut off and terrible endings, but I love them. They were, um, you know, they didn't uh, smooth it over for kids in those days. So I loved all the Grimm's books. And then we lived a block away from the library. So I had a library card when I was five and I would go to the library and all my friends would go, we would take books back. And, um, you know, it was, uh, um, I just loved reading. Right, right, right. Nancy right. Drew, you know, mysteries, um, anything that was, um, you know, it, I, you know, we would just pick it up and then we would ravage it. And then, you know, sometimes we'd come home, my friends and I, we lived across the street. We would all have like five or six books that we would return in two days, you know, and get more. So it was, um, we had, a, we read a lot. We didn't watch tele. Well, we did watch television, but. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how did you make the move into acting? Um, let's see. A acting. Because I was. I was riding horses a lot at the time and I was riding in the country and we were all taking riding. It was, a, we were all at this place and we would take riding lists. And there was a, one of the riders there was um, an actress and she was telling me about classes. And I thought what fun it would be to just do this, you know, take a class. And I think at the same, the same group included Kelly Bishop, who was the first, um, it was the original chorus line. She was the the real diva, not yeah. she was, you know, who Kelly was. And um, so I started taking acting classes and I really liked it. And then I started to pursue it a little more seriously and um, auditioned and there we are. 
<laughs> and is that how you met George and got involved in uh, Dawn of the Dead? Yeah, I got met, met George. I was in an acting class with a good friend of mine, Sarah Venable. Sarah said, since was, was in, she was actually dating um, at the time um, somebody in George's office who was very important, the distributor, Ben Barenholtz. And Ben um, was in the separate office from Richard and George. They were all sharing an office. And Sarah was an actress who was in Martin um, and a few other things. But um, we were in a class together and Sarah said, oh, my God, they're looking for blondes, you know, go, 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 go audition. So I uh, so I went to the audition. And that's how I met George. I didn't know anything about Dawn of the Dead. I mean, Night of the Living Dead. I didn't know anything that he had made. The crazies, none of it. Oh, really? So when you auditioned, had you did you have sides to look at to give you an idea of what it was you were auditioning for? No, I think I think we auditioned at the time. I think it just came in, met George, did a monologue. So I did a monologue. And I <laughs> I since thanked the writer for this. There was a wonderful writer, Jean-Claude Van Italy, who had write, wrote this monologue from a short play. And it was called Are You Safe? And it, well, it's not called Are You Safe? But in the monologue, somebody is asked, are you safe? And uh, and and the other person responds safe how do you mean safe and and they go through this and then they end up describing if somebody crosses the street you say goodbye and somebody crosses the street are they safe will you ever see them again or they be, yeah it was like the moment that the life is so transitory and so i did it but i redid it a little bit as if it actually had happened to me on the way to the audition and I finished the audition on the monologue and George, I remember there was a silence and he said, I'm so sorry. I said, what do you mean? I said, so he said, I'm so sorry for your friend who died. I said, no, 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 no. I was just acting. It was, it was, I was acting. So I think that impressed George that I scared him. And, and uh, that's how it started. So then I went back and did another audition, I think with, I can't remember who it was, if David M. Gee was there or somebody else. I don't remember, actually. But And then I got the job. So what you knew nothing about, what, as you had a chance to research, did you know more about George's work by the time you actually got the script? Or did you just pick up the script? No, we didn't go... get the script. We, I think we didn't get the script until quite late. But, but no, I think George had a... He had a screening party in the office where he screened i think we i think everybody was there i can't remember who exactly maybe scott was scott was in new york so he would have been there and maybe not i'm not sure if kenny um but we all watched night of the living dead and that was when i went oh my god what did i get into and that's like <laughs> this is interesting and then we got the script or maybe we had, I don't think we had the script because I don't think I knew about the zombies. But I remember at the time of seeing Night of the Living Dead that I did remember saying to George that, you know, if I do this part, you know, I ha I can't be passive in this, you know. I mean, this is not going to happen. I can't scream. I can't cry. I can't. I mean, I love what they did, Judith you know, day and, mm. you know, but that was a different time. I mean, we were talking now the late seventies. This was right at the time of Sigourney taking on aliens and the Terminator. I mean, women could not be seen as, you know, just the victim. So that was the condition that I made with George. Oh, interesting. And so what did you think of the part of Francine when you actually got to read the script and what he'd done with it? Well, I thought I thought she was great. I mean, I thought I thought she started off, you know, fairly weak. And that was the, because the guys had, you know, had their camaraderie and were taking over and that sense of the, you know, the, the aggression. And they had the guns and they had the expertise and she was and she was pregnant, you know, so she was vulnerable. Uh, and she was a girlfriend of, you know, uh, so she didn't really have an, a, a presence until the turning point, which actually um, George ended up writing the scene 
while we were in production because I didn't feel that she had enough of um, that kind of, uh, con not control, but uh, equality and, and strength. So that's when he wrote the, you know, I would have all made you breakfast, but I don't have my pots and pans scene where I demanded to fly the helicopter and learn how to shoot. You can't leave me without a gun again. That kind of thing, which turned the tide. And I think that turned the tide for her. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I remember that moment of realizing, Oh my God, she's pregnant. This is and in the film. It just makes you think it's kind of heart rending. Cause you think she really is very vulnerable in that situation. And what, you know, what sort of world is she likely to bring a child into? Yeah, I love it how the guys were going to take care of it. That was cute. <laughs> <laughs> would not go well in this time and age, would it? No. No. <laughs> would not play. What about what was George like? <laughs> what was George like to work with? Oh, George was a dream. I mean, there it, it was. He, he was probably one of the kindest, most sensitive persons in life. But in, on this set, you know, a lot of people change on a set they're panicked or they're they become you know megalomaniac and a dictatorial and all sorts of things and none of which was george i mean george was the opposite he was always calm always listening always no matter how stressed he was and i'm sure he was really stressed at many times um you know he you, he never revealed it and he never um never you know did anything to either the cast or the crew that would, um, you know, make anyone feel uncomfortable. Right. He was, a, right. he was one of those directors that didn't tell you a lot in terms of direction, you know, the words where to put your mark, but um, you would know if he liked it or didn't like it. And, and there would be a way of him sort of, you know, if he really liked it, there would be an, kind of a spark and if you didn't really love it you would say can I do it again George and there would always be yes of course you can do it again you know um he was great and later on it was interesting because when he did creep show which was a high uh highly professional experience cast of decades of work like Carrie Nines and and Fritz Weaver and you know people who and, and um Oh, I can't remember his name. Who did Mark Twain, the actor? Um, well, he's oh, quite the famous. Head, I can't yeah, remember. you'll yeah. look it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hal Holbrook. Hal yeah. Holbrook. Um, you know, they were a little, and, and E.G. Marshall, of course. Oh, my God, what an icon. And they were a little hesitant about, you know, coming in and working with this horror director. And who was George Romero? I mean, he, you know, they'd worked with the greats. And I think every one of them um, had an amazing time and loved it. Vivica Linfers, you know, couldn't talk enough about the incredible experience and how much fun she had working with, with George in that crazy scene, you know, at the, at the grave. Um, so, so that's a real testament when you have actors in their 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, who have worked with the greats and, found George to be one of the, the best directors that they've worked with, who respected them, who understood them, who gave them um, the, the room to do the kind of work that, that they could do. Yeah. And what about going back to Dawn of the Dead again for a moment, what was the hardest thing about making that film? The hardest thing about making Dawn of the Dead was that it was my first real job. <laughs> so I was terrified. And um, I had no idea, you know, I mean, I was just in, in the, George didn't know it was like my first real job because, you know, as an actor, you put things on your resume and it looks like you did a lot. And in fact, the, you know, you're filling it out. And um, I think George didn't learn it until we did a convention years and years and years later. And it was a panel and George turned around and he said, what? It's your first job? Um <laughs> But I was pretty terrified. And then the worst thing I possibly could have done was they allowed me to see the dailies, which was horrible mm -hmm. for me. And, you know, I saw every tick and eye blink and, 
you know, oh, you know, it was just, so I didn't come out of my hotel room for like three days, I think. Luckily, I didn't need to shoot. So I could just sit there and try to figure out what I was going to do. And then we had a break. And I mean, other than that, there was, it was not hard. It was, you know, physical, but not, not hard. The real, um, the real acting actually came once we were in the mall, because that's, that's where, you know, Fran starts to get her legs, so to speak. And so I went to a couple acting classes between when we had the Christmas break, because they had the Christmas decorations up and so everything, and they had to wait till that was over. And then oh. I came back a little bit more um, confident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a very old ad adage, never show the dailies to actors because you just... Oh, it's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fun unless, funnily enough, I remember talking to Doug Bradley from Hellraiser and he said actually he found it really useful because, of course, he was acting through a mask. Then I think it can be very useful for an actor. But... Oh, I think every actor, you know, is different. You know, yeah. for me, it was, you know, I terrifying. <laughs> I think that's very much the common experience from what I've heard of. Yeah, actors. yeah, yeah, because yeah, you you do literally see yourself. But what about a fun part? Do you remember a particularly fun day on Horn of the Dead? Oh, you know, I mean, I think mostly it was in the mall because being outside shooting was not so fun because it was cold and we were, and I wasn't doing that much outside except being on the roof and, um, trying to shoot zombies so we didn't we didn't have a whole and you know it, it was mostly in the mall I would say I think the the fun days in the mall was like you know when Franny is putting on the makeup or you know hanging out and you know the the kinds of things that were happening when um we were relaxed <laughs> right <laughs> before the zombies after the zombies and before the bikers right. <laughs> between that moment yeah. that was we had a good time then yeah good. And nothing was really you know this was not the kind of i think one of the fun days was ter again it was crazy for me was that um when i went up in the helicopter you know i was supposed to learn how to fly the helicopter so george had this uh, he was an army vietnam pilot former Vietnam pilot flying the helicopter who was at part of the company and we were up on the roof and um, we had done some scenes with the helicopter with screen in the background so it as as if I was flying and then there was the helicopter and I'm on the roof and there's the pilot there and the George and I said what what are we doing and he goes well you're going to get in the helicopter and fly I go well I don't really <laughs> he said did you read the script I said yeah <laughs> I didn't think I was actually going to get up there. So he goes, yeah, you're getting in the helicopter. So we got in, I got into the helicopter with the pilot. And um, of course he, he read me right away and realized that this, this, <laughs> this could go well for him. So this was the great shot when we were flying up in the air and all the lights come down, you know, on the Pittsburgh tower and you see that, but um I, I kept looking down and saying, you know, I, I can't find the landing mark. And, 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 and the pilot, he said, well, I can't, he goes, I can't either. But if you look on the right and you look, anyway, he had me up in the air, completely terrified that we weren't going to land. And of course, you know, the whole thing was controlled, but um, George is like, yeah, did you read the script? I was like, yeah. <laughs> so if I got this right, so surely you weren't expected, you weren't a qualified pilot. You were just- No, I don't think anybody that. would let me touch a helicopter in their right mind, you know? No, no, no. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. But yeah, terrifying, yeah. I'd but I hate fl I hated flying at the time. And being in a helicopter is a little, you know. Yeah, yeah, noisy. I still haven't, I still haven't gone in a helicopter since. <laughs> Bart, <laughs> that was the pilot's name was Bart. Right. right. Now, moving on from uh, Dawn of the Dead, you did, uh, in 1981, you did a film called Mad Men. How did that come about? I had a friend, Gary Sales, who was producing this film, and he asked me if I would like to be in it, and I could uh, be the lead if I wanted to have the be in the film, and so that's how it happened. Right. And then they didn't get their money. They were supposed to get their funding in the 
to shoot in the summer. It's the summer camp with, you know, the tales of the madman in the woods. And they didn't get their money until, so they couldn't shoot until October. So summer camp became October, which meant all the leaves were falling off the trees and the set designer was walking around pasting leaves on the trees and spray painting them green. And we were all in long underwear and it was um, a long cold shoot. <laughs> in the woods. In the woods. And a hot tub as well. Oh, oh. Well, the hot tub, yeah. Well. <laughs> what, um, so moving on from that, the other, I mean, you mentioned it earlier on, uh, and that's Creep Show. Yeah, Creep Show is fun. How, did George just phone you up and say, I've got this part? or how did Yeah, it... you want to be in it. I mean, pretty much, you know. George doesn't believe in or didn't believe in like the sequels where you have the same actors and, you know, coming up. Night of the Living Dead, Dawn. I mean, every one of them was a little different. So Creep Show, um, yeah, it sounded like fun. Yeah, it, was it was shot in New Jersey on the beach. Real waves, wave machine. I was in the sand, of course, barricaded so that I was fully protected in a wetsuit. And that was when George was um, sitting off to the side, um, cross-legged in a winter parka. <laughs> and that's when I said to George, I thought it looked a lot better on the other side of the camera than, than where I was. I mean, we had a lot of fun doing Creep Show. Right, and, right. and the best part, the best part was Leslie Nielsen, who was just heaven. He was just classic, you know. Was was he disciplined or was he a joke cracker or Leslie Nielsen? Well, he, yeah. he was both. He was a very disciplined actor. Um, and he had an amazing sense of humor. And um he, you know, I said I've said this many times is that I think we, when there was a show called bloopers at the time on television where they had outtakes of uh, films and television shows. And I think I made more money on the, on the outtakes and bloopers than I did in the film. I mean, every time Ted Danson and I would go up to the door to scare Leslie, he had some incredibly ridiculous thing to do to us, which, you know, uh, us as monsters were completely, <laughs> completely on the floor and then he had this fart machine thing he had that he kept in his hand all the time he loved that so he would take it everywhere we would go out to dinner I know one time we would Stephen King and I and George and Leslie went out to dinner and you know that was it we were gonna hear it I mean he would go on talk shows and you know he, he just thought this was the funniest thing in the world and it was Silly. but he was terrific and when we were putting our makeup on ted and i would sit in that makeup room we had all that stuff that savini put on as the the latex and the, they put seaweed on and we really were disgusting you know we smelled as we were walking but we would watch um forbidden planet on the on the television monitor it was that was leslie's you know black and white film years ago and his, uh, he was a he was a joy. Uh, I, I I only recently learned about Leslie Nielsen and the fart machine. I came. It was one of those <laughs> YouTube. And it's just like really, I had no. <laughs> you just thought it was the funniest thing in the world, and you know when I mean anybody else that would do it would it would be annoying, but you know of course Leslie does it, and you know and he does it. He, he used to do it with, you know, without responding to it at all. It would just come out even even on talk shows he did this all the time on talk shows it's just thought it was funny <laughs> great man absolutely great man now when did you obviously this is such a bit you said it was a massive step up um from dawn of the dead for george apart from anything else when did you realize how long creep show was likely to ask when did you really understand how much the fans loved creep show yeah it's pretty amazing you know creep show and then the 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 you know the the creep show the sequels and then there's the television series you know i think it's funny because of the television series creep show has had a renaissance you know a revival mm. um the original one but i think the original creep show is one of my favorite of George's films because it's funny and smart and you know the horror is comic book I'm not a real mm. horror fan 
the truth is I don't I don't like I mean horror now is huge and it's um become you know uh it's it's really crossing all sorts of um gender and 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 country and race and all sorts of things it's it's becoming the the thing that people want to do from korea to women who are doing horror and um people jordan peele of course is changing horror um uh it's it's amazing but a lot of but that kind of but there's a lot of horror that i don't like and and mm. that's the kind where you know women are the victims and the final girl gets slashed and all of them get and yeah. there's it's very misogynistic yeah i think yeah and um a lot of these 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 films that end up on on television and are not in theaters but you know they're and netflix as well um it's and i think that's one of the reasons there are more and more women who are doing horror you know because it's sort of revenge horror <laughs> that they've decided that they're going to take control of who kills them or who who they kill um but i wasn't uh, uh, but that's one of the reasons i like circling back creep show so much it's because of the comic book nature and and there is a real morality i mean people who are bad get it and you know if if you're good you you know eg marshall was bad so the cockroaches come after him and um you know don't treat your <laughs> your your father well you're gonna get it you know things like that you know you so, mentioned it. yeah Sorry, no, I was going to say that um, you mentioned earlier on uh, that when you were doing Creep Show on the beach, you said to George, yeah, it looks like more fun on your side of the yes. camera. And then in 1985, you went on to work as a casting associate on Day of the Dead. Was that your first kind of move to the other side of the camera? Uh, no, I mean, the casting associate was just mm. a favor. I mean, I just right. did that as a favor to Chris and George, you know, and it was interesting because that day of the day, uh, that day of the dead, of course, um, was the original script that never got made. And it was um, an epic script on the level of Blade Runner. George had created this vision. Do you know the script? I don't know. Oh, well, it's it's stunning. Chris has a copy of it. You should get it. Right. Um, it was it was really epic. It was about how the world had changed um, drastically. And in the same way that Blade Runner, they had, you know, the the, the main world and then the 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 opposition or the you know were on the sort of in the in DP camp, barbed wired off. And I even remember some of the characters' names, like Spider and Mapmaker, and they were wonderful characters. And then the workers were the zombies. So he created, George was so thinking so far ahead that he created a migrant working class. And a, a, an underclass of people who without any rights, I mean, they weren't people, they were dead, but there was the same idea of this. Um, they were factory, they were the ones who were running the engine, so to speak, of the of the, the world. And they were factory workers and they were, um, and of course, in the film, they, they rise up. So the zombies were looking for their rights, but the idea that they managed to, you know, they fed them human food and kept them as workers. So they, they harnessed this, this whole labor force, which is really another one of those great metaphors, you know, yeah. what we do to workers all over the world, you know, and George had the foresight to see this. I mean, the same way that he, I think made the, metaphor for the shopping mall in in dawn of the dead this was a metaphor for the future of what what people would do is that the, the class system would yeah. be created and and then of course the opposition were people that you know were going trying to tear this down i don't know um <laughs> if the idea was to liberate the zombies or just I, i'm not quite sure what the end result was i don't remember that but i remember that was the metaphor and if, and it didn't get me because the money wasn't there, so that's why the the film was um, considerably reduced to the storyline that ended up 
for Day of the Dead, which is a good film, but it it's not the epic that mm. George had envisioned. And it was interesting because when we were casting and I was casting it with this other actor who was, um, I can't remember his last name, Bill, um, I, I'm not sure, but he he was one of the founding members of the Kentucky, of the Louisville Rep, which is a very famous um, uh, acting company and uh, regional acting company in, in America. And we had, I think, every famous Broadway actor walk into our casting office to read for this film because they all wanted to be in it. It was such a good script. And... George was known then, and they all wanted to have a part. It was it was pretty amazing who came through that office. And then, of course, it didn't happen. Right, right. Yes, as is often the way in these things. Yeah. Now, so when did you formally move behind the gun? You're now the director, a very successful director uh, in particularly in documentaries. When did that move happen? How did that move happen? I think it, it well, it started in the 80s. I was directing theater and then I started, um, I was interested in this one project. This And and so I was, I start, it was in the mid 80s and I started with a family who had come from Poland and it was their first years in America. So we were cut, we, we did a documentary. I did a documentary about that. And then um, a friend of mine who was actually an actor who was making his living part time cutting diamonds because his father was a diamond cutter on 47th street, which is New York's diamond market said, you know, you should come up to our place and check it out. Cause this is a place for a documentary. And usually it's unheard of because there's no access given to to cameras in, in this world because of the safety and the money involved. And um, so I did, and he and I, and another person, we started working on this and I started directing this film about Diamond Dealers. And that that was our, my first you know big film and that went to the Berlin Film Festival and it was on you know PBS Public Television Channel 4 in the UK did a two part um two part episode on it they divided they made they took the long one and did did two parts they were one of the first people in money in so it it went it went very well and then from there yeah what was what was sorry what was the name of that dealers among dealers right that was the name and it's still out there it's on vimeo now and you can find it Right. And then I did other films about um, another film that, about the Swiss banks and the Holocaust accounts when that episode happened, when the Swiss um, had held back the money from Holocaust survivors and they were sort of brought to their knees and had to make a settlement finally. But then what we learned as we were making the film, which was exciting because the as they were opening up the Freedom of Information Act, the the this is the year decade of the fax machine so the faxes coming to me were as the documents were being revealed that they were also getting copies to me and so we were finding out a lot about what the swiss were doing at the time <laughs> besides holding back the money for the account so that was called blood money switzerland's um switzerland and the holocaust accounts and that was a that was a production um a, a Product, also at Berlin Film Festival, but it was a production on um, A and E Television. It's a two-hour film. What is it you find most interesting about doing documentaries? I think documentaries for me is a way. It's it's an exploration. Um, it's taken me all over the world. I mean, I've been to Moscow filming mail order brides and the American men looking for them. I've been to Las Vegas and into the, the casinos. The diamond film has taken me to inside the Christie's and Sotheby's auction houses in Geneva. Um, and, and telling people stories besides the travel and going all over the world and, and meeting people are uh, doing documentaries. It's, 
getting people stories and and I think that's why documentaries have become so um popular and interesting for for worldwide now um okay yes of course there's the the murder stories and all of that but I think those human stories are more affecting in many ways than narrative feature films and fiction um that what people experience and what they've gone through and what they um, can reveal about themselves in the world is is captivating to to audiences and that's why um, documentaries are, are I mean so huge right now mm -hmm. and to me it was to me it was that to find out a lot of times what's underneath the story how do you then approach because obviously inevitably you're editing somebody you're you're compressing somebody's story and their life and so on how do you approach find you know portraying the truth of what yeah happened? the truth yeah. <laughs> for killing Kastner especially that was about the truth and and finding out the truth because Kastner who was responsible for saving thousands of Jews during the war by negotiating with no less a, uh, a Nazi than Adolf Eichmann for thousands to go on this train that left and others who would have perished um, but were held in labor camps instead was accused of collaboration and all sorts of lies and, and truths were told about him through the decades and my main purpose at the beginning of the film was to find out what was truthful what was the truth about Kastner I don't know if I did or not in the film but I think I went a long way by going back and 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 doing where the rumors came from and going to historians and going to the people who were saved and and finding out why why all this um the layers of of um truth had we, we had to unearth it we had to unearth where the truth was mm -hmm. and then the other part of it was that I had filmed found the assassin because Kastner was killed in Israel and he was assassinated by of course right-wing extremists and um the assassins were still alive two of them were alive one of them drove the getaway car and one of them was purportedly the shooter and he he had all sorts of variations on what happened and so it took a long time i think i i had interviewed him hours and hours and hours and first on audio and then in on film to find out where the truth lie in his version of the story and then weaving the film together i had to create um where i found if there was an objective truth or not but i had to find a way to tell the story so that people at the end could decide for themselves, in a sense. Yes, That's and it. and I have to say I have watched it, and it's it's extraordinary. I, it Thank was you. Quite, I very much lost for words while I try and put my brain into gear. I think because it was obviously it was it was something I'd never seen. It's the story I'd not heard about at all. Yeah. Has it ever been? Has it ever been dramatized? Has it ever been made into a fiction? In Israel, they did a play and they did a television drama of the trial. Uh, since then, it has not. Although we have been um, trying to get it done, um, it, it would be a great drama. For for um, we've tried. <laughs> well, I, I, it's it's what I find fascinating, as you say. I think. There, I, I do love watching documentaries, um, but sometimes you just want to a fictionalized version of it. Yes, um, is it is more communicable in terms of reaching a wider audience sometimes. Because well, maybe times are changing. That it will be. You know, I don't know why there was such a resistance. To, I think. I think the difficulty with the Kastner story is that there still is such opposition to him 
from the people he didn't save. You know, it's interesting. I always say, you know, when people did Schindler's List, I mean, two million Jews perished in, in Poland, but people remembered those who were saved by by Oscar Schindler in the factory and who are called Schindler's List, the list that he made of um, people that he wanted to, who were in the factory and that they should not be killed, mm. not sent to the, to the gas chambers, the crematoriums. And in Kastner's case, uh, 500,000 Jews perished in Hungary, but instead of thinking of the way the list, the, 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 those who Kastner saved, they think of those who perished. Mm. So it's it's a different emphasis. So there's I don't know if it's because Kastner was Jewish. There's still a lot of resentment that uh, about him in in many ways. So that may be one of the the controversy that makes it more difficult for um, an, a fictional version of the the story. But at the same time, I think um, we're sophisticated enough now to open. Um, more controversy and to look at it. Although I will say times have become very sensitive these these yeah. this period and, and because of anti-Semitism, certainly in America and in the world, you know, people are very hesitant about doing anything in, in that way. And so I don't know, you know, it, yeah. it may happen. One day. What are you what are you working on now? What am I working on now? Well, I'm working on interesting. I'm finishing. Oh, I did this boxing film that that I filmed twenty years ago that we finally are finishing, which is great. I mean, with sort of uh, ironic is that boxing may be fading as a sport. We're not sure. Maybe not in England. <laughs> but, no, but, it's still very much seen as a way for young men who've got difficult backgrounds to break out. And I'm just thinking, this is probably not the best way but that's just me yeah i don't know i mean it's true you know in america it's it's interesting that you know it's it's boxing has has waned as a as as a sport but then extreme fighting that mm. you know has risen so i don't know if that's any better you know um but anyway i think that the film is almost done and and we're, we're gonna you know see how we can launch it and then i'm working on another story which i think is really interesting called sapiro the jew who sued henry ford because in the 1920s henry ford the automobile magnet was a huge anti-semite i think he was also beloved by hitler <laughs> hitler hitler thought henry ford was terrific there was a lawyer who was organizing farmers internet in Canada too, to get the the proper money for their product. And, and it was huge. It was huge in the 1920s. And he had rallies of thousands and thousands of people who would come to these rallies and literally save agriculture in Canada because of this. But that brought him to the attention of Henry Ford. And that was the reason that in Ford's mind that the Jews were taking over the world and and the economy. And so Sapiro decided to sue Ford that he couldn't say these things. So everybody knows that there was a lawsuit with Henry Ford and that Ford was an anti-Semite, but nobody knew who sued him. And it turned out this one guy was the one who stood up to Ford all by himself and said, you can't say that. And this was preceded all the other trials about anti-Semitism and other things that, that had happened through the decades. I mean, the last one I think was in Charlottesville about the white supremacist. Um, but this was before, before the thirties, before Hitler, um, his rise. Um, and Sapiro was the one person who said, no, you can't do that. So it's, it's sort of, it's a story about the trial, but it's his, the story about him. We don't know anything about him, like we didn't know anything about Kastner. Fascinating. Actually, both of those sound absolute. Actually, I don't know. I can't watch the boxing one. I have a thing about. <laughs> no, you don't like to see people hit. No, I can't. I can't. I just can't. can't it's it. interesting while I'm editing it, you know, and I had to edit a lot of the boxing fights. It was sort of like, I was thinking what Thelma Schumacher was doing when she was editing Raging Bull, you know, you're, you're like, editing oh that's a great smash and oh that's great you know that that really took him out you know and you're it's like 
sick, you know, but you go, but it's a great shot. Um, and you disengage from the actual violence of it in a strange way. Wow. Well, so that's what you're working on at the moment. Have you got anything else in the future that you'd like to do or you're hoping to do? Well, I think the Sapiro story, we just came back from Western Canada and it was really remarkable how um, the, I've never been there. It's all prairie land, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres uh, of just wheat land. And um, they all remember um uh, Sapiro and 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 they remember or many of them um count him for responsible for saving generations of, of their farms and it's very interesting is that they didn't know the story you know borders are funny you know Canada didn't know the story about the trial and the anti-semitism and we didn't know the story of what Sapiro did in Canada but that was remarkable that you know, when you think about it, thousands would come to a rally and they just didn't like drive there. <laughs> they had to go on horse and buggy. They had to take a day and a half of their farms. They went on trains. I mean, this was, um, you know, what it meant to is the similar feeling of what, you know, creating a union would be like. Um, and what what an oratory and, and his oratory a large part of it we've talked about democracy and the need for democracy and what could be more timely than that now, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that sounds on a great note to wind up. Galen, thank you very much. This has been fascinating. Well, Nick, this is this is great. I mean, I think it's it's interesting that all these decades after doing this film that not only is George remembered, but the actors in his film and, um, you know, that, that I meet these incredible fans who, um, you know, they weren't born then. <laughs> they had no idea what they, you know, they weren't in, they were, you know, they were the grandsons and granddaughters on, um, and seeing a lot of women. Mm. Uh, in in these these conventions it's really uh, really impressive and I have to say you know people ask me because this is not their world at all so they're very interested you know when I go to the conventions and I was just one weekend of the dead in Manchester which was great Marcus Lewis's um, convention there and then I was two years ago right before COVID had this amazing one in Japan Tokyo they said what what are these people like you know and it's very funny, but I have to say they are the sweetest, kindest people around. I mean, you know, you go to them. We've been mm. at uh, conventions together. Yeah. Um, they, they couldn't be nicer. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. like, you know, so I really enjoy them. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. thank you a lot. This has been great. Thanks again to Galen Ross. What a fascinating career she's had. Join me in a couple of weeks when I'm talking with another guest from the worlds of horror, thriller, and suspense. In the meantime, stay safe and well.